Our next presenter, presenter is, called, is Heather Holm, and she's going to be talking about creating a bee-friendly garden. And um, our, she's the author of Pollinators of Native Plants. Heather is a landscape designer and, culture, and consultant specializing in native plant landscapes and landscape restorations. She is currently working on a three-year study to determine the types of native bees that pollinate cultivated blueberries in Minnesota, the forage, um, the native plants that can be added to, to attract and support the bees, and ways to provide additional nesting sites within the farms. Heather writes for the social media website House about pollinators, beneficial insects, and native plants. More information about her work and speaking engagements can be found if you want a website, www.pollinatorsnativeplants.com, all one word. So I'd like to introduce you to Heather. So bees, pollinators, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about bees this morning. And many of you probably don't realize how many types of bees we have. So in, in North America alone, we have over 4,000 species. And just, just recently, we have a sort of a historical list of the numbers of bees that we have in Minnesota, and it's around 425. So just to give you an idea, uh, honeybees are just one species of 425. And so I like to kind of draw the differences between honeybees and native bees, because most of us based our model of what we know about bees on honeybees. And honeybees were actually introduced from Europe when some of the first European settlers came to North America. So they are radically different than all the other 400 plus species of bees that we have in Minnesota. So they nest differently. Uh, so honeybees are highly social. They're, they live in a colony with many bees. Almost all of our wild bees nest by themselves. And what's important, if you're here to learn more about gardening for bees, is that all, most of the, or all of the wild bees are nesting in our gardens, compared to a honeybee who uh, forages in our gardens during the day, but then returns to its hive in the evening. Uh, most of our wild bees either nest in the ground or in some kind of cavity, and they have an annual life cycle, and they have really a really short adult lifespan. And I'll talk about their, their life cycle in more detail. And our wild bees in Minnesota do not produce honey. I get that question a lot. You know, we, we associate all bees being able to produce honey, and it's just honeybees that produce honey. So bees are vegetarians. They uh, are related to wasps, and at some point in time, they decided that they no longer wanted to hunt other insects, and they became vegetarians with a completely plant-based diet of pollen and nectar. So pollen is their source of protein, and they glean uh, carbohydrates and amino acids from their nectar. So not all plants are created equal. So some plants, uh, the protein has a very, or the pollen has a very low protein content, whereas other plants can have a very high protein content in their pollen. And the same with nectar. Some plants produce nectars that are, have a very high sugar concentration, whereas others have a low sugar concentration. So as far as a nutritional standpoint, not all plants are created equal. So there's some plants that would be much better for bees nutritionally than, than others. So just the female bees are typically doing most of the work in the life cycle, and they're the ones that have the, some kind of pollen collecting structure on their body. Whereas males don't do any of the nest building or pollen collection, so they often look uh, very different than females when, uh, if you're observing them visiting flowers. So just to give you a sense of some of these common uh, bees that we have in Minnesota, they range in size. Of course, our bumblebees are our largest species that we have. And some of our smaller species are literally about half the size of a grain of rice. So I tell people, wear your bifocals if you want to see the really, the really tiny bees. And you can see they, they vary in coloration patterns. Some of the sweat bees uh, can be just a brilliant emerald green in color. The, the egg opossum in, uh, there's some other sweat bees that are all green. Uh, so they, they can really vary in, in coloration and size. We also have cuckoo bees. Uh, they, people often think they're, they're looking at a wasp, but a cuckoo bee is a bee that has lost most of its hairs on its body. It doesn't build its own nest. 
And so instead it preys on the other types of bees. It slips into a nest of another bee and lays its egg. Similar to the strategy of a cuckoo bird, or a, or a cowbird is a better example in North America. So the same strategy, the cowbird lays its eggs in the nests of other birds who then rear their young. And we have 18 species of bumblebees in Minnesota. Often people think a bumblebee is a bumblebee, right? This large black and yellow uh, colored big bumblebee, and uh, there, there's just real diversity of bumblebees. And if you're really interested in identifying bees down to species, bumblebees are a great place to start because you can identify them based on their coloration patterns, whether they have black, yellow, orange, or white hairs and the patterning. And just stop by my table, I have some ID sheets to give you a, a better uh, example of what each species looks like. So just to quickly go over the life cycle of uh, the solitary bees. So the adults are out, I mentioned, for a short period of time, two to six weeks. The females typically live a little bit longer and closer to that six week time frame because they're finding a nesting site, they're out foraging for pollen and nectar from flowers, uh, they're returning to the nest and combining those two materials, and they form this pollen ball or bee bread, combining the pollen and nectar. So depending if they, they nest in the ground or in a cavity, they're going to make several foraging trips out in the landscape until they have enough uh, collected to make one bee bread. And once enough is collected, they, they'll lay a single egg. So they kind of repeat this process over and over again over several days as, as she's building the nest. The larvae hatches and that's its sole food source, this pollen ball that's got a little bit of nectar combined in with it. And so the development phase is usually one year. So if, they're a, if you're a type of bee that comes out this time of year in early spring, then you're likely overwintering as an adult. If you're a bee that comes out in midsummer, then you would be overwintering as a, perhaps a pre-pupa or a pupa stage. So it really depends on where the life cycle falls and where, when the adult comes out. So most of our wild bees are nesting in the ground and they're looking for areas of bare soil. They have a hard time if we're gardeners and we're putting down um, sort of layers of heavy mulch or plastic and rock. Those are things that can uh, not provide nesting sites for the ground nesters. They're also all very small in size, so and the female has to excavate this long burrow or shaft and then several lateral shafts to make individual brood cells. So there, there's a lot of digging and excavation that goes on. So soil needs to be loose in structure, um, bare so they can find a nesting place uh, and, and with soil that's not compacted. So I know what you're thinking, why do I want ground nesting bees nesting in my garden, right? Well ground nesting bees, the wild bees are um, not aggressive whatsoever. It, they, we often associate our experience of being stung by the social yellow jacket wasps. So yes, the yellow jacket wasps do sting and most social insects are more likely to sting and they're aggressive. But uh, the wild bees uh, typically won't sting. So they're, they're great to um, introduce into the garden and, and allow them to nest. And again, that activity that's going on with the female excavating the nest, it's a very short time frame. And often people don't even notice that they have ground nesting bees in their garden. So here's just a few common ground nesters. The mining bees are out right now. The majority of the mining bee species are spring specialists. So they're the type of bee that's maybe pollinating all of our woodland wildflowers. You'll see them uh, visiting flowering trees right now. Same with the cellophane bees, there's a few species that come out really early in the spring. Uh, in the summer months, in June, July, August, you'll see the species that are on the bottom part, the sweat bees and the longhorn bees. So this is what the nests look like. People say, well, what are these ground nest be bees' ground nests look like? And they basically look like anthills. So there's typically a, a hole with some soil deposited around the opening. The, okay, this photo is several nests together in open bare soil. So some bee species like to nest together in what we call aggregations. Others just will build their nests singly in the landscape. So sometimes those species are harder to find because you don't have a lot of uh, activity or nest um, sort of clustered together. So as I already mentioned, compaction can really be detrimental 
uh, for providing nesting sites for ground nesters. Tilling can also affect nests because that nest is in the ground for a year. So if we till, uh, if we till in June, we're potentially destroying nests of adults that are about to emerge in July. So it's really, really um, look before you till if you do till or if you have a veggie garden because that loose soil is attractive uh, for bees to initiate nests into. Well, rodent holes I'll talk about with the bumblebees next and why we need some rodent holes. So bumblebees, have a, they're a social insect. They're actually fairly closely related to honeybees. They start out their nest as a solitary nest, though, with one queen bumblebee. And queen bumblebees overwinter under the, in the ground, typically in an abandoned rodent hole. And then the queens are emerging this time of year. They get cues from, from when the soil temperature's warm and they'll start to come out. And they're like the solitary bees, they're gonna be looking for flowering plants, collecting pollen and nectar. But unlike the solitary bees, the bumblebees will make this really large pollen ball in the nest. And the nest is usually in Minnesota, our bumblebees are nesting at the ground level or again below ground in some kind of a, uh, former rodent hole because they need somewhere that's, that's going to provide insulation, especially in Minnesota when we have some crazy fluctuating temperatures in the next six weeks. So she makes this really big pollen ball, lays multiple eggs on the pollen ball and her first offspring are female. So those, those daughters or workers become uh, the, the bees that will now take over the foraging in the landscape on the flowers, while the queen can remain in the nest and continue egg laying. So this time of year, we're gonna see larger sized bumblebees, which would be the queens. And once they've uh, initiated the nest and produced some offspring, we know, typically no longer seen queens after June, mid-June, July. So because the workers have taken over and the workers are smaller. So late in the summer, typically the colony will produce some males and their role is to mate with a certain females that they've groomed in the colony to become queens the following year. So our bumblebee colonies, everybody in our bumblebee colonies dies late in the fall, except for those newly mated females who will find a place to overwinter in the ground. So that's our bumblebee life cycle. So our cavity nesting bees, which are the minority, are nesting in some kind of pre-existing hole, whether it's in a plant stem, uh, it could be in a standing dead tree. So this is just a picture of an uh, elm tree that succumbed to Dutch elm. The bark has sloughed off and it's showing uh, some beetle larvae holes that have been left. So bees will reuse those holes to, as nesting sites. But the more typical place for cavity nesters to nest is in plant stems. So whether some plant stems, again, most of them need some kind of pre-existing hole, which means the plant stem has to be hollow. We do have a few exceptions, and one of those is the small carpenter bee in the bottom image, which will actually chew its own hole into really tiny plant stems that are solid. So you can see that pithy material that the small carpenter bee is <coughs> chewed out of the plant stem. So his, these are some of our common cavity nesting bees. The uh, leaf cutter bees, most of the species are cavity nesting. We do have a few that will nest in the ground. So they're like anything in nature, there's no succinct rules for most <coughs> things, but uh, the other three are all just cavity nesters. Mason bees will be out in the next couple weeks and they are used as an alternative pollinator to fruit trees. So their adult lifespan typically overlaps when our fruit trees are flowering, including uh, apples or plums, for example. So the leafcutter bees are probably the least picky out of the cavity nesters, and they will nest in a number of different places, including holes in rocks. People have found them trying to nest in the end of their garden hoses. Uh, even the hole in, the fr in your front door, they have found leafcutter nests. And you can see why they're called leafcutter bees. The females have these really large, oversized teeth or mandibles that they use to cut pieces of leaves from plants. So if you grow roses, um, apparently, I don't have roses in my yard, but I've had many people tell me that their roses have these leaf cuts that the leaf cutter bee has used. So she's cutting oval pieces of leaves, overlapping the pieces of leaves, forming a cylinder within the cavity, and then that's where she places her bee bread. And then she'll cut a circular piece of leaf to cap that cylinder. And then she repeats the process as she backs her way out of a cavity. 
So if you see plants with uh, really nice circular or oval leaf cuts, starting from the leaf edge, then it's just the work of the leaf cutter bee in. So don't, don't get out the pesticides. It'll be short-term short damage while she collects some nesting materials. So what can we do for cavity nesters? One of the simplest things to do is uh, when you cut your perennials down in your garden is to leave some stem stubble from the previous season's growth. I cut all of my plant material down now in, in spring and instead of cutting it all down to the ground I leave, I leave 12 to 15 inches of stem stubble. And this is a passive hygienic way to support cavity nesters. There's a lot of uh, people offering bee boards or boards that have holes drilled in them and what a few, few recent studies have come out have found that they are actually not helping bees whatsoever. They're causing more of a hygiene problem. So we're trying to come up with other ways that um, these stems are going to naturally degrade and won't get reused. There'll be less pathogen transmission because they're not close together in close densities like a bee board. So this is just an easy thing you can do. I know it's not pretty, but remember your perennials are going to grow up and cover that stem stubble in no time and you will forget that there's some stubble there. And you can just maybe dedicate a little back section of your garden if you think your neighbors are going to be concerned about your, your messy stems that you've left behind. I have a question. Yeah. If I cut them down to about three inches already, did I kill a lot of You didn't kill anything, you just, uh, um, yeah, so they're going to use the previous season's growth. There won't be any insects in those stems yet. But, but if you kept any of the stem sections that you cut down, you could just stick them in the ground if you've already, yeah, if you haven't put them out to the curb yet or anything. Yeah, so it's not too late. Yeah, there, there won't be any insects in, in there yet. It's only when uh, perhaps snow, natural, natural occurrences with snow load would break the stems over the winter, and then the following spring that would provide opportunistic openings for them to build a nest. So unless an insect is bored into the stem during its growth period in last year, there usually isn't any insects in the stems. Well, they're in other stems, so if you provide stubble this year, you're going to attract the cavity nesters to your yard, and then they'll nest in your stems this year, and then emerge ne the following year at whatever time they, depending on what kind of bee they are. Yeah. What's the statistical probability that you're going to, if you've got some stems in your yard, that they're actually going to come? Is it like 10 percent? Uh, it really depends on the surrounding habitat and where you're landscape or garden is and what's around it, uh, what the bee population is before you, you, know, you provide the stems. Uh, we're trying to come up with more succinct numbers. So I've been uh, uh, collecting all the stem stubble and giving it to uh, a researcher who's researching specifically the cavity nesters to sort of come up with a, more, a better answer, but we don't have one yet. But even just in my own yard doing it for the last four to five years, uh, I, get a, I get a lot, almost 60% of the stems will have some kind of bee nesting in it. So, Where so do you live? I'm in Minnetonka, so not too far. So threats to pollinators. I'm sure everybody's heard many things in the news that bees are in trouble. Um, and so for our honeybees, it's, there's a, much more information and studies that have been done on honeybees because we, we, they nest in managed hives. We know if honeybees don't return to their hive or we find thousands dead in front of the hive, we have a problem. With wild bees, we don't have uh, a good way to monitor them because they're out nesting in the landscape by themselves. For the most part, we have no idea where their nests are. So the, the things that we know that are affecting wild bees are uh, habitat loss, so they just don't have uh, suitable nesting sites and they don't have suitable forage. Uh, invasive plants can also be problematic, or, or especially in urban areas where our landscapes have been radically disturbed or changed and are now dominated by one species where before they were a diverse amount of plants flowering throughout the season. And then of course pesticides have been in the news. Uh, what people perhaps don't realize that all pesticides can be harmful to pollinators and bees not just the systemic insecticides or the neonics that we hear about. So all insecticides are designed to kill insects and most of our pollinators are insects. 
So whether you're using a contact insecticide or a systemic, it still can pose a problem for bees. The, the systemics or the neonics are very problematic because they're often used in our landscape industry. So the plants are presenting pollen and nectar uh, that has the systemic insecticide in it. So uh, be buyer beware, and Patricia is here from Humming for Bees, uh, one of the advocacy groups, and she can help you um, find out what local nurseries are offering safe plants for bees. So bees, uh, how do we help bees in the garden? Plant uh, many different flower colors, flower forms, and also plant masses of the same plant together. Instead of planting one purple coneflower and then another way over on the other side of the room, for example, plant many of the same plant together. It makes foraging much easier for bees. Bees expend a lot of energy just flying. So if they're gleaning a little bit of nutrition from a plant here but have to fly uh, to your backyard from your front yard to get to the next flowering plant, then they're really expending most of that energy that they've gained visiting the plant. So many of the same plants mass together. Make sure you have something flowering throughout the growing season. Uh, often in gardens we have a, a gap of when things are flowering. So if you can sort of evaluate your landscape from year to year, see if you have uh, a time period where you don't have anything flowering and then add something, a plant or two that will flower during that time frame. That would include annuals. Annuals are a great way to fill some of those flowering gaps. Uh, pick annuals that are single flowered form, some of the older varieties, uh, single zinnias, cosmos, um, even some of the spring bulbs like daffodils can be good to help, you know, that especially in early spring, we often don't have as many things as we would like flowering this time of year. So yeah, annuals are a great way to, especially in May when you, after you plant them. Uh, let's see, I think I'm done because we're out of time. So I, I'm going to just leave this slide up uh, to sort of summarize some of the points hopefully I touched upon. And as I mentioned before I started, I have many plant lists downstairs. So if I, and they're all customized based on a specific soil type uh, or shade or sun or a moist. So if you're doing a rain garden uh, or if you're gardening in the shade, I have all specific plant lists for bees for those sites. So come and ask, talk to me afterwards if you have any additional questions. But do we have time for? Couple of we got time for a couple of questions. Okay. Is so anybody? Can you talk a little bit about so there's bees and there's wasps and yellow jackets? Like yep. We want the bees, but I personally don't like getting stung. Um, right. Are we like are we supposed to spray those or just leave everything be? So yeah, wasps, they're just the social wasps, the ones that are building some kind of paper uh, nest, whether it's above ground or the yellow jackets build a, basically one of those paper nests below ground. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that you, the wasps that you'll be stung by and we typically only have three types. So avoid any paper nests. The other large wasps that are flower visitors uh, are, are all solitary. So they, they, they don't sting and they aren't aggressive, but they can be really scary to see. But wasps, all the wasps are beneficial to have. They are carnivorous and they're often out hunting in our gardens and landscapes, taking away some of those insect populations that we want to kept, kept in balance, such as soft flies or um, you know, moth caterpillars in some cases. So they are okay to have around, but just be wary if you have a a ground nest being built somewhere where you're going to have kids or pets or traffic nearby. Yeah. So I heard, so solutions though. Um, like for example, we have a, a swing set that we have recurrent problems. Okay. So they, if you have. That then bite the children. Yep. So they, uh, the, the, the social wasps typically look for a hole. Uh, they'll nest in, uh, so if you have a hole in the wood structure of the swing set, now is the time of year to, to caulk it over or to, to fill the, any holes where you know a previous nest have been, and then they won't have the ability to initiate a new nest there. So come, go out this afternoon and, and, and look for holes on the swing set. Now there you may have, uh, they may be attracted to if it's bare under the swing set, you, you'll want to look for nests being initiated if it's bare ground.
because the, the yellow jackets who are the most problematic, they need uh, some kind of hole or entry point into the ground or into a structure. So if you can find any holes or in, a, in a structure or in the ground and close them this time of year, then a nest can't get built in that area. Yep. I have a question. You were talking about they like bare ground to make their uh, yep. nests. So if you have a lot of wood chips on um, everything, there's not enough bare ground? Is that yeah, so, so we, you know, we often are using now the triple shredded mulch, which is great because it knits together and forms a nice weed barrier, but that is almost becomes an impenetrable place for bees to get through. When, traditionally, bees would nest in uh, mulch landscapes that used larger, almost chunks or chips, and they can get under those and into the ground more easily than the triple shredded. Yeah, so even if... Um, right up against your, if, if you have any areas that are bare or things don't grow very well, those areas you can leave a small patch just kind of bare. Even lawns that are sparsely vegetated, you know, the grass is sparse, mm -hmm. you'll find some species of bees will, will use the, just the spaces between grasses. So, yeah, it really just depends on the bee and the location. To encourage ground nesters, or yeah, that can be. Diff is it a new construction too, or is your soil? Okay, so with clay, you can um, add um, compost or leaf litter to start building up the organic matter, and then the soil microorganisms will help to start break that that soil structure down. Prairie grasses, if it's sunny area, the prairie grasses that like clay will help, their root systems will help break into soil. And when a third of those root systems die each year, so they actually do provide uh, entry points for ground nesters to get into the clay. So think about um, plants with big root structures like the prairie grasses that are gonna help uh, break up that compaction. Yeah. If you irrigate your lawn, is that helpful? Uh, not for the bees that nest in the lawn. That could potentially impact their nests. Yeah. But aerating does provide um, bare spaces. So in that case, you know, it could create new nesting sites, but on a short term because the grass typically grows back in from, from where it's aerated. Yeah. I was going to say about clay soil. I've also heard that if you're going to have it in a certain patch, where you want to plant some flowers or such, that you can get sand and mix it in with the soil. Yeah, you can do some soil amendment. Uh, my philosophy is to work with the, the soil that you have rather than to amend it because amendments are short term. So if you find the plants that like the soil that you have, it, you're making your life much easier in the long run. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, Heather, we'll be downstairs if anyone has any more questions. Thank you.